between the four or five of us this morning, if you look at the number of years of experience of these speakers, there will be about 300 plus years. And I think any leader will benefit from what comes from 300 years of experience. My part today is to speak on the subject of habits and patterns. And I have a PowerPoint to share that with you. But what I did is I have it in two parts. The habit part, I took it from Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. The pattern part, I took it from the Bible. So let's just look at it, habits and patterns. First of all, what does it mean when I say, or what am I trying to say when I address this issue of habits and patterns? Number one, all leaders, whoever you are, have habits and patterns that they use. Some of them are good habits and patterns, and some of them are not good. Uh, we are controlled by our habits. We do things almost automatically. Our habits takes us places. For example, if a person has a bad habit, such as drinking or taking drugs, then that habit will take him down instead of take him up. If a person has a good habit, which is to read books, to study, to improve himself, then those habits are going to definitely make a change in the person's life. And so I want to take the subject of habits for this reason. The first one is basically what are habits and patterns? They are the usual things that people do, whether they do it knowingly or unknowingly. And how are these habits formed? Psychologists tell us that if you do the same thing from three to four weeks, over and over, again and again, every day, you will form a habit. So if I want to pick up a habit that is good for me, and I have the discipline to do it from three to four weeks continuously, it will become part of my habit. For example, if you want to wake up at six o'clock in the morning, and you do that for about three to four weeks continuously, the chance is that it will become your habit in about three to four weeks. If you try to go to sleep early at nine o'clock in the evening, and you do that three to four weeks continuously, it will become part of your habit. So this is how habits are formed. Also, on the next one, I want to address the issue that we do have toxic habits. Maybe we don't even realize it, but what are these toxic habits and how do we get rid of them? It's a good question. How do people develop good habits and how do they maintain them? So Stephen Covey was written extensively on this subject in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, shares seven great points. I'll just list them first and then I'll try to describe each one of what he meant. First one is be proactive. The second one is begin with end in mind. The third one is first things first. The fourth one is think win-win. The fifth one is seek first to understand, then to be understood. Number six, synergy. And number seven, continual improvement. Let me look at each of these habits that Stephen Covey wrote book about. First one, proactive. Proactive means what? Well, there are two kinds of people, according to Stephen Covey. There are people who are uh, uh, in, in a reactive, and there are people who are proactive. Example, reactive person will say, um, 
20 years ago, uh, the cost of gasoline was $1 or 75 cents per gallon. And they will bemoan and talk about that because they are reactive and they will talk to you about how things cost less but now how things cost more. That kind of, according to Stephen uh, Covey, that kind of thinking does not help us. A proactive person, on the other hand, would say, yes, the price of gas was 75 cents 20, 30 years ago, but it's not that now. So what do I do? What must I do to make sure that I can pay the two hundred? Uh, the two dollars or the three dollars or the four dollars that the gas per gallon is today. What are the things I need to do? That is a proactive thinking and that is a habit that people have. So check what kind of habit you have. Do you have a habit that is proactive or do you talk about what happened 20 years ago and bemoan that? That is what Stephen Covey talks about. The second one that Stephen Covey talks about is how people must begin with end in mind, not the beginning, but the end in mind. He uses an example which is kind of morbid, uh, or the example that I'm using is a kind of morbid. He says, if you died, and on that day of your funeral, what do you want people to say about you. And if you don't want people to bemoan or to talk about bad things that you've done, start doing the good things that will make them proud, that will make them happy, that will make them remember what you have achieved. He says begin with the end in mind and work backwards. Where do you want to be 20 or 30 years from now? or even 50 years from now. Begin with that kind of thinking. Stephen Covey says that successful, highly successful people begin with that. What do I want? What is the end result? And then they work backwards to make sure that they get there. That's the kind of habit they do uh, enforce and try to live by. The third one is first things first. Stephen Covey uses uh, what is called the four quadrant uh, picture, and I have it on the power book, uh, power uh, point, and it is it has got four quadrants. On one side, it has what is important and what is not important. On the other side, it has what is urgent and not urgent. So quadrant one is something that is important and urgent. That is something you have to do. That is something that must be accomplished. Example, you have to produce a report tomorrow and your boss says to you, I need this report 8 o'clock in the morning. That is urgent. That is important. So what do you do? You drop everything else and you do that. That is quadrant one. Quadrant two, it's important but not urgent. In other words, you have time to do it. If for the same scenario your boss says, I need a report on such and such a subject in two weeks from now, it is important, but it's not urgent. You've got time to, to plan for it. So what is that? Quadrant two, which is planning. Quadrant three is something that is not important, but urgent. For example, you have to make sure that you call your wife or you call your co-worker. It's urgent, but you don't have the time to do it. So you can have somebody else delegate that authority to somebody else. You can delegate it. It is important. It is urgent, but not important. It can be delegated. Somebody else can do that job. All right, and the fourth one is not important and not urgent. So Stephen Covey says that part of the work is where you can almost eliminate it out of your life. It's not important, 
it's not urgent. Phone calls that are just for friendly phone call sometimes are urgent, sometimes are important. You have to identify which one is which. But sometimes it may be not important, not urgent. You can eliminate it. So Stephen Covey on this third uh, habit talks about first things, putting first things first. And highly successful people know how to do that. The fourth one is win, think win-win situation. There are four possibilities in this. One is win-lose. And some people think only that way. How can I win and make the other person lose? Boxers are like that. Okay, we're not boxers in life, but boxers are like that. Because if they lose, they lose the money. If they win, they win. That is number one. Number two is lose-win. You lose and you let the other person win. Uh, that's not many a time something that people like to do. Number three is lose-lose. Both sides lose. Nobody comes out a winner out of this. Some political issues seem to be like that. Somebody wants to put in their part, another person wants to put in their part. Instead of coming to an agreement, they both lose. And the fourth one is really what we want, which is win-win. In other words, you win and the opposite side also wins. And that is more difficult to come up with. And that is why a compromise and ability to work together comes in. And Stephen Covey explains that also. The next part that Stephen Covey gets into is seek, seek to understand first. Seek to understand first and then to be understood. Many people want, uh, for example, when raising children, instead of listening to them and saying, what is it that you want? What is bothering you? Many parents want to tell the child, this is the way you must do it, this is the way you must do it. Children usually don't understand that. So if we approach it, if we have a habit that says, let me understand what you are saying, let me listen to you so that I can understand what you are, where you're coming from, and then I will tell you what I think about it. This is what Stephen Covey calls seek first to understand, then to be understood. He divides that, I don't know if I have enough time about it, to ethos, pathos, and logos, he calls them. You can read it in the book. The ethos part is the emotional bank to listen. The pathos part is building trust in person. And the logos part is the reasoning with words. The next part that Stephen Covey shares is synergy. And he put, and I've put synergy and continual improvement together. But synergy is really teamwork. No one person, the, the group, the whole, is better than the part. That means one person can't do it all. Companies that have used teamwork achieve more success than companies that make people compete one against another which means if all of them are working together to accomplish a job and each one has a part, he can do his part the best way. And then when you put them all together, that is what Stephen Covey calls synergy. And the last one that he uses on number seven is continual improvement. On this one, he uses the example of a person that is using a saw to cut wood, but the saw is dull and somebody comes along and sees what is happening and says to the person why don't you sharpen the saw and the person says I don't have time to sharpen the saw uh -uh. if he takes 10 minutes to sharpen the saw he might finish the work half hour early so if you don't sharpen and sharpen your tool then it will take you longer time and people with successful, highly successful habits, effective habits, know how to sharpen their salt. They take 15 minutes a day to read something that will help them to improve their ability. They take 20 minutes a day to spend with people 
that are going to input them and that they can improve their own output and help somebody else. These little minutes helps them to sharpen their own abilities and to sharpen their tools. Now let's go to the second part. I call it patterns. And patterns, I took that from the Bible. Exodus 25, Exodus 25, 40, God told Moses, he said, see to it that you make the pattern, you make the tabernacle, everything that I show you, according to the pattern which is shown you on the mountain. God did not want creative ideas from Moses. He showed him the pattern of what things should look like. And if we take the time, we don't have the time to do it, but if we take the time, the Ten Commandments is first one of those. It's not the Ten Suggestions. It's Ten Commandments. They spell out exactly the pattern of how to believe God and how to serve God. In other words, there is no uh, bad habit that comes into that because the pattern is already set for us. Next one is the tabernacle. If you look at the tabernacle, the whole thing, the measurement, the rooms, where things should be, what should be carried out in each section is spelled out. So the pattern is given. Why? Because God is trying to shape the pattern, the habits, the exercise of his people in the right direction. The third one is the priests. A priestly duty is meticulously described by, the, uh, by God and given for the priestly duties. They know exactly what should be done. Even their clothing of what they wear is given directly from God what they should put on, what they should put on, how they should do it. And then the prayers and the sacrifices are given to be done in a certain way. Why? Because God is forming a habit and a pattern in his people. This is the way I want it done. Next, if you look at Jesus himself, Jesus did not just come and say, do whatever you want. He said, this is what God wants. He had, in my estimation, three laws. Okay, Jesus worked from three laws. One, I call it the law of love. Why do I call it the law? Because he said you must love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He was very specific about that. Okay, he was setting a pattern and a habit for us. Two, he had the law of obedience. He said everything I do, I do it because the Father wants me to do it this way. I am doing it in obedience. In other words, I'm not a free agent to do whatever I want. You and I, as leaders, God put us in that position to do a work. And if we know that, we will obey. Okay? Number three, real quickly, the law of service. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to give my life a ransom. So he gives us these patterns very clearly. The last one in conclusion, there are four questions that I want to leave with you. That way you and I can be leaders that God has inspired. And this is really to influence us. Number one is examine your own life honestly. What are the habits that you have which are helping you to make your job God's uh, God's way of doing it in a godly manner. What are your habits? Are you getting there early? Are you praying about it? Are you asking God's wisdom? Are you doing it diligently? Ask yourself these questions honestly because God put you in that position of leadership for a purpose. Number two, see which ones of your habits are toxic. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, we're not perfect. Some of our habits are toxic. Some of our habits are not right on. So what do you do? You change those. Number three, you repent and change. The word repent in the Greek is metanoia. It actually is change your thinking, change your mind. 
It has changed the way you do things. That is what this is all about. And the reason the PGI is formed is really to influence you, to influence the leaders, to change our minds and to do things in God's way. God has something better for us. If we allow Him, He will help us to change our attitude, to change our habit, to change our patterns, to make them better and godly for Him. And number four, highly effective people practice on a daily basis good habits, good patterns, good way of doing things. They don't leave it up to chance. They do their very best to accomplish what God has for them. Remember the centurion in Luke chapter 7, verse 8. When Jesus, when, he, when they said, the centurion wants you to come and pray, Jesus said, I'll come and pray. But the centurion sent the message, said, you don't need to come. I am a man under authority. I say to this one, go, and to another one, come, and to the third one, do this, and they do it. Why? Because I have authority. I am a leader. I am exercising my authority. Jesus, he said, you don't need to come. All you need to do is say the word, and my servant will be healed. The Bible says Jesus marveled and said, I have not seen such faith in Israel. Why did Jesus say that? Because this man understood what habits, patterns, and ways of doing things in leaders is supposed to be like. And he understood that principle. And when he said it, Jesus said, this is a great faith. So I pray a prayer for you, leaders and future leaders, is that you will have habits and patterns and ways of doing things in your own self that makes you a person under the authority of God. And God bless you for that.